house is full of light Life is change Even death is not stable I wouldn't know because I'm still living at home for the summer, so I'm still basically being hand fed for one last summer. But, oh, no, no, come on, bud. The word summer will lose its meaning. It won't have weight anymore. Oh, yeah, this is our last summer. I've been saying that the whole time. Well, you're, I'm still, I still have more summer. Yeah, you have more summers, but. I'm being jumped in, being thrown in head first. <sighs> These ones are scared. Is this one scared? Huh. Some things. I'm scared of some stuff. I'm worried. Honestly, about making money more than anything. Because I've gotten to a place where I'm happy, I'm content. But I was content with the stuff I knew. And so, moving forward, when I'm struggling more and trying to find, here you go, whenever there isn't as much consistency as what I'm used to, will I be able to maintain that same contentment? Life gets crappy, and I'm sure that we're about to experience that really for the first time. Just life being really hard and relying on yourself, which <laughs> is something that at least I haven't had to really do so far. is the things that are common to everyone. Okay. So. It's like good is just lesser than great? No, no, no. Good is good as there's things like love, family, universal human experiences, the types okay. of things that everyone shares in common. So I kind of like the feel good stuff. Yeah, yeah, pleasant. And great okay. is the stuff that sets an individual apart. Okay. And then in the in Christianity of the Old Test like Old Testament, God is great, powerful, focused on judgment, has the promised land, the people that he takes to this land. Okay. And then you have later Christianity starts focusing more on goodness. Okay. And how to be kind and nice. And then the church starts really cultivating that and I think takes the sheep metaphor way too far where it turns everyone into sheep, like in Brothers Karamazov, the Grand Inquisitor, where the okay, problem yeah. there is that the people are too good. Right. They're just sheep. They just follow right. whatever they're told. And greatness is gone. Right. But Nietzsche really liked Old Testament God because Old Testament God was great, and Nietzsche likes power, greed, and 
for sure asserting yourself. So the whole like the eagle you. and the rabbit thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't. I haven't heard of that terminology applied to Christ. Like with, the Christ himself. Yeah, like with Christ as great God that kills greatness and decides to be humble over the good. And in doing so, it's higher than greatness because Jesus killed greatness itself. So it's like abdicating the great in the sake of the good. Yeah, it's, if you can, if you're, it's, if you're great, cool. Yeah. But if you're gooder than great, if you can kill greatness itself, you become great and then kill the greatness. Then suddenly, to be good, <laughs> and you do it in a cycle, then that's better okay. than both. Okay. Because if you're just good, I, I see what you're yeah, saying. If you're just good, you've never achieved. You've never s strived. You've just settled with the things that are universal to all people. Right. Which, which there is merit in that, though. Yeah, there is. But if you're great, then you're the CEO who's cold and ruthless. But if right. you can do both, if you can become great and then kill the greatness and choose to be humble, that's if, if you're you're choosing right. to choose to be humble, you have to have reason not to be humble. Right. So it's have, if you want to die to yourself, you have to have a self worth dying to. For sure. Idea. Having a self worth dying to. So cultivating the self and the individual, then tearing it apart and choosing to be good instead. Suddenly you've done something greater than great, gooder than great, and you do that in a cycle. Makes sense. I hadn't heard it. And the good, great terminology really works and applies to a lot of things. How I'm wondering how you would apply that to like the individual level, though. I mean, beyond because okay, I understood. I understand good and great. I think of like a country like Sweden and Switzerland, where like they're good, and it's a place that everyone wants to live, and the quality of life is super high, and people are really happy. But they also never put a man on the moon. And like they never did this. America is a great country, but I think we struggle with the good. It's like, a, and she did not put this level of thought into it. It's just some stupid catchphrase, uh -huh. and it sounded stupid to everyone else. But Hillary Clinton saying America is great because, because it's America good. is good. Yeah, yeah. That's just accidentally. Said. She doesn't but know. She did, yeah. If you analyze it, you could say that she's she's saying we should be good instead. We shouldn't focus so much on greatness, right? But which is the mentality of a lot of people right greatness now? Greatness is. I mean, it's like that. It's like the. I think it's like Venezuela, some country like that. The president there is super popular and he's super loved, and he lives in like a shack. Like he's the president of the country, but he gives off like ninety-eight percent of his earnings, and he literally like lives in a shack, like on a bed with a bedside table, and that's like all of the possessions that he owns. Gooder than great. Right. Exactly. Because he showed that. Achieve it. For sure. Decided to be humble. Exactly. It's that choice. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, my parents met at LCU. They met at a school here in Texas. And so that's what I feel Lubbock ends up being is this place for family because a lot of time people will come here for college, whether it's for LCU or Texas Tech or South Plains College or any of the surrounding schools, and they meet there, they get married, either in college or right after, and then they have kids. And they send those kids to school, to elementary and then high school, and then they go off to college. And maybe here or maybe they go off somewhere, but if they stay, then they meet their spouse in college, then they have kids, and that generational cycle just continues. Lubbock becomes a place where the only thing there really is to do here is raise a family. And it's an awesome place for it's a, it's a great place to raise kids. It's a safe city, it's comfortable, tons of food, tons of great schools. And so it makes sense. And I think that's why when I went to college, even though I went to college in California, that was my expectation, that I would leave college with some semblance of my future family with a wife or at least a serious relationship that I knew was heading in that direction and so to be leaving college without that seems a bit strange that I haven't 
found or started making that family. It's a great place to raise a family. Yeah. But my reaction to that is, is or my reactive question is, is it a great place to raise an individual? Because you have you have a lot of individualistic tendencies, not in like the. Um, but by that I mean that you have nuanced ways of thinking and you sure. try to break free from molds. Mm -hmm. So this feels like a, uh, the kind of place that tries to maintain molds. I think that me. that's the tendency. I think there is a tendency towards stagnation. Um, I think that I was lucky to have really incredible parents, not that other people don't, but I had great parents who always pushed me to be an individual and I also am blessed that I made the choice to get out of here during college. Uh, I mean, you remember how I came in as a freshman. I was definitely a product of my environment in a lot of ways, and going to school in California woke me up in some ways and showed me other perspectives and taught me critical thinking. And so I think this is a great place to raise kids, and if, you're, if you have good parents, I do think that you can be set up for a lot of success here. But if you stay in Lubbock, if you get stuck here, I don't know if that final step will happen. And that's where the generational cycle comes from, is that if you break the cycle by moving away from Lubbock, well, then you've broken the cycle. But if you don't leave, it's almost inevitable that you're just going to become the foundation of someone else's story mm -hmm. rather than really taking charge of your own story. You just become the next step of the cycle. Yeah, which I think, in the totality, it's important, but it does feel like you just get lost in the masses. It doesn't, it well, doesn't give you, to me it feels, here feels like a, it feels like a beanbag chair where you sit uh, in yeah. and it's comfortable, but then you start sinking in and suddenly you can't really get up and you keep falling deeper and deeper into the pleather until you <laughs> fall into the multitudes of people who have contributed to right, right. maintain the family, the generational family structure of Lubbock, right. but it doesn't let you be an individual. So that part's kind of, it's almost sad that you lose individuals. You have to sacrifice individuals to have this kind of place. I think the difference is that I don't see that as fundamentally sad. I think that it's fundamentally different. Mm -hmm. And I think that Lubbock is, when you get into that cycle, your motivations change. It stops being selfish. It stops being about, I want to really make something of myself. If you want to do that, you really go to California or you go to a place like New York or a place where things are very progressively moving forward and there's space for you to, to latch yourself on to that forward momentum. You don't have that momentum in Lubbock. And so once you're here, there's a healthy and an unhealthy way to do it. But if you're here and you get into that cycle, the motivation changes and it becomes that cycle. It becomes, okay, now my goal is to raise my kids in the best way I can and to raise my family as productively within the cycle as I can. Because you can get stuck in the cycle and in that generational system where you just lose your fire for life, you lose that spark, or the family becomes that spark. And in some ways, I think it's the difference between being selfish or selfless is what's going to save you in a place like Lubbock. If you're selfish, then your spirit will die in a town like this. It's hard to be selfish in Lubbock and succeed. But I think that if you're a selfless person, there aren't a lot of better places out there. If you're a selfless person that really wants to just dedicate yourself to a family and to the people that you love, this is a really great place to do that. So now you just have to start a family. <laughs> Easy as that. Now I, just have to find, now I just have to find a woman who likes me, so that'll be the hard part. <laughs>
flashes when we die? How do we know? I mean, that, that's kind of a big one, I guess. We can get into that. No, how do we know that other people have died? Like, how do... I'm not sure how I would follow. I, how would I find out that you died? Dude. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure my family would let you know. Like, my parents have your phone number and stuff, so they okay, just What about out. more distant friends? Or what if they didn't have my phone number? Would they have to... How would they know who to contact? And if they did contact me, who would I reach out? Would I have to send it in a group message? Like if I died? If you died. I'd have to send in a group message, Chris <laughs> died today. If, you, if his family doesn't have your phone numbers and you haven't heard. Yeah. And is the onus on your family? They would be the most Well, distressed. that's also, and I'm sure, yeah, that's the last thing they want to be worrying about. Yeah. That's morbid. But... When we graduated, and they call 800 names before you, it makes graduation feel a little less special, seeing just how many other people are doing it at the same time. So yeah. even if it's morbid, maybe walking through a cemetery has kind of the same impact as graduating. Or yeah, it's morbid, but everyone dies. It's not special. You only remember, the, the only people you remember are the people who haven't died. I think that's also really morbid. I think that's just, I don't know, that's, I feel like that's kind of a disservice to what life is. Cause like when I walk through a cemetery, I don't think like, oh, there are so many dead people here. Guess death isn't really that big of a deal. It's just one more name on a plaque or whatever. I don't know, that's not what I feel. To me, it's like every grave that I walk past, I feel like the weight of their life. I don't think about the fact that it ended. I think like, sure, I don't know any of these people in this random graveyard, but I know that each of them had a life each of them had a family and loved ones and friends and people that cared for them. And sure, some of them might have had more than others. Some of them might have had happier, more successful lives than others, but they each still had a life. And since I don't measure life's value purely off of success or anything like that, just seeing every grave and knowing that every single person buried there had just as much life as I do now, that's almost like an infinite feeling of human life and experience to me. It's not lessened by the quantity, it's a sign of almost the infinite quality instead. But if it's, if it's on a spectrum of infinite, then are you admiring the life of the particular, you can't know the individual, so it's not the sure. life of the particular person, it's just the concept of life. So it's life as a universal experience that you're admiring. I mean, yeah, I do, I do think it is. I mean, I don't think I have to know somebody to recognize the beauty in their life and the beauty in their existence. I think in some ways, not knowing them makes it easier, makes it better. Because like when you do know someone, then you have some sort of comparison you can make because they were a part of your life just as everyone else. And so you can think about how good of a friend they were, how good of a person they were, but at least by like your own standards. And so I think in some ways it's easier with strangers because I didn't know their imperfections. I just know their humanity. In some ways, I think that's really optimistic. I think that, that just shows that on paper, I'm a lot more optimistic than I am I guess, interpersonally. Well, because then you're just being 
you're optimistic with the idea of humanity, but pessimistic with humans. Uh, human. <laughs> yeah, I love humanity, but I'm, I struggle with humans, yeah. maybe. To me, it's the... I try to be more cynical with the idea and the concept. Oh, totally. Because the cynicism <laughs> creates a bit of critique and right. lets me... It helps, it helps me understand things better mm -hmm. and develop more interesting perspectives. But with the individual, I can have a high degree of optimism and benefit mm -hmm. of the doubt. Because as much as I can talk about how little death is if there's so much of it, in a conversation with the individual, I can see a high value, like the boober I thou. Yeah, yeah. And for me, I absolutely recognize that every person has value. I just struggle, I think, to manifest that all the time. I don't always know how to act as though that's true. Even though I believe it and I know that it's true. Sometimes I struggle to remember that in the moment or in my actions. So I think it's like maybe you should like think like a cynic, but you shouldn't act like one. Because I, I think like a cynic with the hope that life experiences will prove me wrong. Mm. So I set up my framework cynically so that then conversations and relationships can undermine the cynicism. Because then the power is in the relationship. In, 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 by power, I mean like the power of influence. Sure. And I think for a lot of other people, it's like the cynicism undermines the relationship rather than vice versa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I give the relationship high salience so that it can counter the... Because the cynical stuff usually makes more rational sense. So by giving the relationship and that experience more salience, then when I experience something that seems at odds with the rational, cynical conclusion, mm. then that argument feels stronger, the optimistic argument. But that argument almost relies on the fact that relationships are, by nature, irrational, then. Is there a problem with that? I think that in itself might be some of your cynicism leaking through. Saying that it's irrational? Saying that a relationship is irrational, I seem like I think that's a little All the rational components of relationships are psychological egoism and I'm just in this relationship because I know it'll benefit me in X amount of ways and it's transactional and it gets rid of I think that it's not cynicism leaking through. I think that that's almost a hmm. metaphysical transcendence. So it's infusing spirituality. I guess it just doesn't sound like it. Feels like it. <laughs> He's looking for his family. He's looking for the sun of the sea. See you.